Good morning, everyone. I would like to share with you a little bit about the challenges and opportunities of advancing into the brave and um, uh, new world of online learning. And um, I wanted to say that part of what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the story of what happened with San Jose. Many of you have probably uh, been following a lot of the stories in the headlines in the media, and not everything you read is always true. So what I wanted to uh, assure you is I'll try and give you some of the, um, the, truth, the true story behind the media headlines. Um, I'm very pleased to be with this very august group of, of people here today, assembled here today. And But just by a show of hands, I'm just sort of trying to get an understanding of the proportion of the audience here. So if you would raise your hand if you are from a public institution. OK, so that looks like about more than, maybe more than half. Private. Oh, it looks like it's about equally divided. Okay, that's very, very useful. Uh, raise your hand if you're from a relatively large institution, say from 10,000, 15,000 above. All right, and then raise your hand if you're below, let's say, 7,000. Okay, okay, so about a third to two thirds. Okay, that's very helpful. All right, so um, I would tell you that you don't have to worry about taking copious notes. The PowerPoint will be available for you because I do have a fair amount of data and some citations there for you if you want references later on. Um, I tried to tailor this uh, talk specifically for those who are in leadership positions because that is what this conference is all about and to give you some concrete and specific advice about um, recommendations for how to proceed forward. All right. So, um, I assume most of you are here because you are contemplating uh, either starting online learning at your institution or possibly um, expanding online learning in various capacities. So for many people um, in our roles, if you're a provost or vice provost or something in that uh, higher level of, of administration, um, this may seem like a new development. But in fact, uh, distance education and then online education in particular actually has a very uh, long history. Uh, you can date it back, and some of this is uh, from Kenneth Green in his uh, publication here, but you can also find this elsewhere. But, um, and I know there's a, the provost uh, from NYU is here, but uh, we, Casey, Kenneth Green actually um, accords the first distance learning in the United States to uh, CBS and NYU's partnership called Sunrise Semester. Does anyone remember Sunrise Semester? Oh, there's a few of you, okay. Believe it or not, this they uh, you know, televised, it wasn't online, it was televised courses in a course in com uh, comparative literature beginning at 6 a.m. and at that time, <clears throat> I think there were 177 students taking it for credit and 120,000, sorry, there should be another zero there, that were not taking it for credit. So that was probably our first evidence of a, a televised MOOC, if you will. And um, obviously you can see here that there's University of Phoenix came in at, at uh, 89, the internet and ARPANET um, came forward in 69, as 69 University of Phoenix, um, 89. And the World Wide Web, 91, LMSs became available beginning in the uh, mid to late 90s. And uh, we're very fortunate we have Candace Steele here who started Carnegie Mellon's online in initiative along with MIT Co Open Courseware. That institution started around 2002. Um, so what does this mean for online education today? Now this is uh, data from uh, the you know, Sloan C's report from 2011. You can see here, see I have a pointer? Um, that the number of students listed here, and this is the total number of online. So over f for fall 2012 up to for fall 2011, the number is continuing to increase overall in the United States. And so this meant that in 2010, the report was filed in 11, over 6.7 million students in the U.S. were taking at least one online course. Now this was a course before MOOCs, that's now changed, and 32% of the students in our uh, universities today are taking at least one online course. So if you ask <clears throat> um, CAOs, uh, Chief Academic Officers and Provosts, uh, and this was a study done by uh, ASCU, American Association for State Colleges and Universities, um, why do provosts, what do they perceive as the benefit of online learning? Um, what do you think is the most, the biggest uh, rationale for why institutions are interested in going to online? Anyone have a guess? Cost. Cost is one, that's not number one. Access is number one. So uh, what we find in this particular study, this was done in uh, 2013, just this last year, um, in the respondents, uh, 
the top one, two, and four re reasons for why provosts are interested in online learning is due to access. You can increase um, number of students, you can attract students from outside the traditional service area, and obviously increased enrollment. Now, along with that, interestingly enough, number three was the second large um, overall reason was that provost thought that this could increase um, improvements in the pedagogy and the teaching. And then the one that people s said off the bat was revenue, right? And then this uh, comprises that iron triangle of, you know, how to balance access, cost, and quality. Now there are many other reasons that were cited in this particular uh, survey of provost. So you can see here, uh, <clears throat> as you contemplate growing your online programs or courses, you can be mindful that there are multiple reasons for why one would want to do that. So uh, obviously you can use this for increasing professional education, both of your students as well as those in your local regional service area or beyond. A lot of the universities are beginning to use it as a brand, in a form of branding. Um, you know, degree completion, believe it or not, number nine, 29% said they wanted to use it in case of a natural disaster. You could still maintain course continuity in the event of earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> increasing the diversity of the physical body, student body, physical plant, retention, containing cost, alumni and donor outreach, 8% um, there. So. What this tells you is that uh, CAOs have a whole litany of different um, possibilities for why online learning is important. And it's also reflected similarly by presidential surveys. So here's a 956 campuses were surveyed. The presidents said that again that access was number one, uh, increasing revenue number two. And this um, interest on the part of presidents differs depending on the kind of institution you are in. So that's why I was interested to see who was here because in in fact, community colleges, um, and this is not just in their data, but in other um, surveys and reports also, you'll find similarly that community colleges are the most open to, um, you know, and feel most positive about online learning, and uh, then followed by public institutions and finally by independent and privates. Um, some people may then say, well, this is kind of old data, 2001. What about now, after the MOOCs have happened? And the interesting thing is the Sloan C report from 2013 says that the number of the perceptions of um, academic leaders on online has not changed dramatically. Um, in fact, down here, they have said that um, all of the decrease, the slight decreases that you might see between 12 and 13 after the MOOCs hit the, the airwaves, is really attributed to the institution, leaders at institutions without online offerings becoming more negative. So it's not necessarily reflected in the, the other um, segments of the um, uh, higher education. Okay, so if, if CAOs and presidents are putting in online, not courses, we're talking now degree programs, which ones are the most common? Anyone have a guess? Engineering. Not engineering. Business. business, and then what's after business? Exactly, healthcare. All right, so the most frequent, and this is divided by undergraduate and graduate, and uh, graduate degree programs. And these are degree programs. So as you can see here, there's a number of uh, business programs that top out and both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Then you have healthcare, but here you can see here clearly that, let's see, ed, uh, you know, I don't see engineering in here. Computer science, yeah, okay. Sometimes computer science is uh, in colleges of science rather than engineering. But this is based on the, the um, survey from online college students. This is the number of students enrolled in programs, okay, of this kind. So again, when if you are a CEO or president, you need to think about which degrees are the ones that are most um, amenable to online instruction, online uh, pedagogies, okay? So that's something to consider as well. Um, probably the most recent survey that just came out this in last month is the Babson Research Survey. This is a pretty large survey. It was done by Babson in con uh, collaboration with the College Board. They surveyed 4,726 institutions and they received 2,831 responses. And so that's a pretty high uh, sampling rate of almost 60% and 81% of higher education enrollments. This is not a long report, but you can find it at this URL. And again, this confirms what we already know from prior reports from Sloan and elsewhere that uh, BA institutions um, that are 
private are more likely to be the most negative, and again, um, you know, G uh, community colleges and um, AA institutions were the most positive. Uh, but again, here again, we see here that institutions that are um, are the are saying that it's very critical to have some understanding and planning for how online either courses or degree programs can um, move their agenda forward. All right. And then the most recent data now says that there are 7.1 million students, uh, this is both done by Babson and then Department of Ed, have differing figures, but it's a growth rate of 6.1% students entering into the online uh, you know, market. All right, all time high, a third of the students in the US are now taking courses, at least one online course. All right, so this is just uh, food for thought as you continue forward. Now, normally, now everyone, there are no for profits, I think, at this conference. Is that correct? Are there any for profits here, Kathy? I'm sorry? Oh yes, Coursera is here. Okay, uh, but they're not an institution, right? So when you think of, we're, we're talking, today's um, conference focuses on what does this mean for residential colleges? Uh, but, and of course we know that when we talk about online institutions, they do exist, right? We have the University of Phoenix, Capella, Kaplan, and so forth. But now we wanna ask how does this new form of um, instruction fit within a residential uh, setting? So. Um, here's where it becomes interesting. Um, prior to 2012, when you thought about online courses and online institutions, you saw, you thought about things like Phoenix and Kaplan and so forth. And so in 2012, just when you least expect it, who enters the market for online and makes a huge splash? It was Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. And these are, you know, arguably one of the three most um, you know, elite institutions in the United States and very focused on traditional um, ivy covered wall, bricks and mortar instruction. So this meant that this, there, all three of those entered into, um, into MOOC, into MOOC territory, right? And so this is, um, you know, in fact, it's so much so that the New York Times declared 2002 to be the year of the MOOC. And um, so these obviously are the, the three biggest headline uh, in, you know, institutions or groups that uh, were involved in the MOOC movement. And so my dear friend and colleague, Anat Agral, who's here from edX, um, Sebastian Thrun from Udacity, and I believe there's some uh, representative from Coursera here uh, with Daphne and, and Andrews Coursera. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, these, uh, these uh, MOOC providers are often in the limelight, continue to be in the limelight. And so what does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with me? Well, I can tell you that um, when they first came on board, when MOOCs first came on board, uh, and I began reading about uh, the headlines that MIT edX, when their joint press conference with the two presidents uh, came forward, I was a new provost at uh, San Jose. and. Uh, my daughter was going to be graduating in June, um, you know, in Cambridge, and so I said to my president, uh, Mo Kaomi, um, I'm going to be there in June. Should I, would you like me to try and meet with some of the folks who are developing the MOOCs at uh, Harvard and MIT? And he said, yes, absolutely. So um, I was uh, going to send an email to Anat. I sent an email to the provost at Harvard as well, and um, was able to um, meet with Anat. So Anat, uh, turns out that Anat, I know you're, where are you Anat? Are you in the audience? There, there's Anat back in the back, thank you. Um, Anat, Anat happened to be giving a talk at the Thai conference that was being held in Santa Clara Conference uh, Center, and my president happened to be there. So after the, um, and Anat was giving a keynote speech there, he approached Anat and said, my provost is gonna try and contact you to meet you in June. And Anat said, oh, that's great. Um, and disclosed that actually your wife has a, a, a bachelor's degree in physics from San Jose and you lived nearby the campus. So we already had a nice connection there. So I went to see Anat and um, volunteered. Up until that point, MOOCs were still um, being out there in the real world, but with um, real world people, not with faculty at another institution or students enrolled in a university in, in a systematic way. So I sort of went to Anat and said, let's consider doing a mini pilot, a pilot test using real faculty and real students uh, with the material that he had created in his circuits and electronics class. So the question is, what is what's the impact if we could study it um, in the real world with 
with real students, and particularly with very diverse students. So, um, so San Jose raised their hand and said, yes, we'd like to, to try. And Anat was so generous in saying that he would be willing to partner with us. And uh, some would say that this was uh, very um, like Icarus, maybe going a little too close to the flame. But for me, as uh, John says, I am a social scientist. My background, my doctorate is in cognitive and developmental psychology, um, <clears throat> Michigan and then uh, Princeton. So for me, I wanted to try uh, and get empirical evidence on how this might affect student learning or not. So a little bit about San Jose State University. We're part of a 23 campus um, system in the state of California, the largest system of its kind um, in the world probably. Uh, we, San Jose has the uh, noted uh, being the oldest campus, over 150 years old, actually founded as a teacher's college prior to the Civil War. And we had at that time 30,000 students, extremely diverse as you can see here, no single majority, and um, a very large number of degrees. And, and fairly highly ranked in US News and World Reports, if you believe in them. And um, so the question was, how could we do kind of a pilot study? Well, we launched the first university MOOC pilot in 2012, starting uh, with the faculty that summer and launching it in that fall. Um, this was coupled with a presidential grand vision. Uh, we, the campus sought out um, national media press, and I will warn you that if you seek it out, then you need to deal with the aftermath. <laughs> And that's something that, as, um, as those of us in higher administration, sometimes we're not schooled in the, the, uh, how to deal effectively with the media. So make sure you have a great uh, marketing communications uh, team with you. Um, we, my interest, again, was to do uh, the mini experiment and then to disseminate the data and try and move forward in a kind of a more comprehensive way about how this can affect student learning. Um, here, then, again, coping with intense media is, is uh, it's a, it's a, you know, goes with the territory. So what was our first? We actually did two MOOC experiments. Um, technically speaking, what San Jose State did was not actually um, create MOOCs, because if you think about the word MOOC, it's massive open online courses, right? But in, all, in our instances, we were offering credit and we were charging students. So technically speaking, these are not MOOCs, they're not free. And, and they were not open because students had to register and pay. All right, but we, we, what we did, what we tried to do is to see if the MOOC environment would have an impact. So here's a knot, and in this case, this is Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Um, also be, be aware that once you venture into the rarefied air of um, you know, the, the MOOC providers, uh, you will become uh, very, you'll attract the attention of legislators and governors. <laughs> who both got involved in our experiment as well. So this is our President, President Mo Kaomi at San Jose State and Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. This is a press conference held on the campus and Anat came out. And this was to talk about what we did with ed MIT edX. At, at the time that um, I met with Anat, there was only one course that was uh, available and that was Anat's electronic circuits course. It's a fabulous course. It's an upper division required course for engineering majors, not all engineering majors at MIT, but it's a course that is required for engineering majors across the country, rel relatively the same amount of uh, types of content. At San Jose State, this course is called EE98, Circuits and Electronics, and it is required for all engineering majors. As I said, uh, it's not required for all of them um, at MIT, mostly, I think, uh, electrical and, and computer. Um, this and Anat is very brilliant because he actually created, when people think about online courses, they um, that conjures up different impressions of what that means. And what I'm here to tell you is that the technology has advanced tremendously. So what you think of an online course is not actually probably all that informed. I'm just getting a question. How many of you have ever taken an online course? Oh, a lot of you, that's fantastic. And I assume you're taking them through the MOOC? MOOCs, is that it? Um, and then how many of you have ever designed and taught an online course. Oh, quite a few of you, that's fantastic. All right, so then I'm speaking to the choir. But the, the best thing here about Anat's course is that he um, told me, and, and maybe he'll talk about this at some other point, uh, that part of the reason he was doing this is that normally when he would teach this course at, to his students at MIT, maybe 200 students in an auditorium, maybe 20% of them would show up. 
And I was shocked. I said, oh my gosh, these are MIT students. Why aren't they coming to class? And he said, well, they don't have to. They're MIT students. They can learn it on themselves. They can um, search on the internet. They can read the book and so forth. So what he wanted to do was to say, uh, that he would like to create shorter videos that students could download 24-7 instead of the university saying, I want you to come and sit in this seat at 8 a.m. Um, and you have to learn on my schedule that allow the students to choose the time that they are ready to be able to learn. In addition, he supplemented that with online quizzes, of online virtual laboratory, which is a very good um, tutorial. To, uh, tutorials. This was actually a very important feature of his course that we found discovered at San Jose. And this is a tutorial was where two uh, professors would gather together and they would argue about different ways to solve the problem, uh, the same problem. And so students had a role model of how to watch that there were multiple answers to an uh, individual question. There was an online textbook also published by Elsevier that was free. That saved um, $150 per student on our campus. Um, when we did the pilot, a combined savings of $12,000, and then uh, virtual office hours. Okay, so this was um, what uh, MIT did, and what, what we did at San Jose was not said, give me three of your faculty and a grad student, I'll fly them to Cambridge for a week, and we'll make it accessible all of the materials for free for our, our small little pilot. We did this all without any attorneys, no MOUs. It was fantastic. <laughs> Probably will never happen that way again, but ah, this is the result. So what happened is we, at our campus, um, this course is a relatively large lecture, uh, anywhere from 90 to 100 students. There were three sections and uh, faculty in one section volunteered to teach the course. So they went to MIT, they studied and met with their Anats uh, great team there for a week. They worked, came back over the, um, after the, they went in July, they came back a month later, and then they knocked on my door and said, you know, we've never taught a completely online course. We're not, we're not comfortable doing that yet. Could we flip the course? And so as, a, as provost, I said, Sure, uh, you know, if you want to take a middle step, that's great. And so what they did instead was that they had students, remember those, um, you know, those six different elements, five, six different elements. The students watched and did all of that uh, information outside of class, and then they came in and had a highly structured, it meant 90 minutes twice a week, worked, and when they came into class, it was highly structured segment, segmented um, activities, but all of it was um, group work and then there was individual uh, quizzing as well. And so as a result of that, what this, what, this is the result of the study. And so in the traditional, traditionally taught course where there was a lecture, 59% uh, of the students passed. That's a pretty high failure rate. When they came and took it with the flipped model using the course content from a knot, the, the pass rate went to uh, I'm sorry, 59 passed, and 91% uh, passed. So it was a tremendous increase in the student um, uh, performance. And as a consequence of that, uh, we began talking about it within the system, and we created a S SJSU edX Center for Excellence in Adaptive and Online Learning, and then uh, worked with our chancellor's office at the system level to invite other campuses who had engineering programs in the CSU to, to have an institute to learn how to do this. So 12 other CSUs joined us uh, last summer and began to learn how to use the, M the edX uh, material in flipped models. Um, so the campus is still interested in expanding to other edX courses, which I can discuss later, and then obviously uh, in involved in publishing and disseminating this data. Yes, yes. Can I ask you about the um, assignment to these different groups? Well, it was it was not uh, a scientific study. It would be more like a field 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 work field study because what happened is, remember these faculty. Uh, I, I came back and asked the dean, find me three faculty, and a grad student. So he did so, and that was in June. And then in July is when they went, they actually went around 4th of July, went to Cambridge, worked for a week, and that meant, and they said, can we wait for another semester, another year to implement? And I said, well, you know, the, the content's already there, so it's really a matter of figuring out how do you implement that content. You don't have to create the content. And so I said, could you see if you would be willing to try it for the fall? And they went back and they came back and said, yes, okay, we can do it flipped 
for this fall. So one course, uh, which was originally supposed to be taught in the traditional way, and he's a full-time lecturer who taught, has taught there for over 10 years, said he would be willing to do this, flip his class. The other two sections were left alone. Okay? So what happened is that students in this section uh, then got a message in the summer, and then again as classes were beginning to start saying, it's, they still come to class, just like all the other students, right? But they were told this was a flipped class, so there will be material that you'll be needing to access online. And when the, pre the professor came into class the first day, he explained the whole thing. He said, this is MIT content. This is an experiment. And if you want to leave, you can. We'll create, we'll, the, the engineering school was willing to actually create another section for students who did not want to participate in the experiment. Only two students said they might want to switch, and in the end, nobody switched. Okay? So it was not a random selection of students. But the, the data, uh, when you, they have done the, the data on the individual students, the students in these, this section did not differ in any substantial way from the other two in terms of prior. This, this, I think this class you see had 78. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that was our edX um, you know, experiment. And the edX experiment was a very positive one. And did the, did the press pick up on that? Not so much. <laughs> uh, so what, what happened next is that um, we thought, let's try something else. Now, in the case of edX, that is where faculty are creating the content and we're using someone other, another institutional faculty's content. Here, we wanted to say, I said, we have great faculty at San Jose State. Why don't we let them create the actual MOOC? Let them create the content. So this is where we partnered with um, Sebastian Thrun and Udacity, just down the road in Palo Alto. And um, so what we did here was we had an initial meeting to discuss which courses should our faculty try and teach. Well, we knew that, um, that one of the toughest courses, now, and of course, the MOOC content is best um, graded, machine scored, if it's quantitative. So math and sciences lend themselves more naturally to um, computerized scoring. And therefore, we decided to focus in on math courses. And we also knew that the Gates Foundation is very keen on trying to eliminate the roadblocks that that's, uh, stop students from attaining post-secondary uh, college uh, you know, degrees and so forth. So math turns out to be a very difficult course for students to achieve, um, particularly from underserved communities. And so we settled on three courses that we would experiment with, remedial math, introduction to algebra, and introduction to statistics. And as provost, I went back to the deans and departments and said, Is there, are there any faculty who would like to um, take part in an experiment and create our own MOOC in partnership with Udacity? And was able to then get five faculty, two teams of two for remedial math, for statistics, and then one single faculty in algebra to uh, take their courses that they normally taught online, I'm sorry, in classroom, and convert it, or they called it Udacify their courses. And, um, and of course, this got, again, again, if you seek attention, and we did national press conferences, guess who came out? Uh, we had Governor Jerry Brown, who is an extremely, and you know, if you've uh, read any, and those of you in UC certainly know this, that he was very keen on this notion of um, you know, MOOCifying courses so that you could address that iron triangle of cost, access, and quality. Uh, reduce cost, increase access. So what I would tell you, though, is that we, uh, in, in my role as provost, I wanted to make very clear that, again, this is going to be a limited experiment, that we wanted to ensure some degree of empirical verification accountability. So uh, we partnered with the Gates Foundation, who was willing to give us a small pot of money to assist with um, the students. And then the National Science Foundation also gave us funding to do the actual study uh, of the outcomes. And I think that's very important if you want to show that it's it's a third party that's uh, conducting the assessment results. Um, uh, so what I would say to you is that this spring, you know, we started into this partnership in the fall, in the late fall, and the courses were going, and by the way, this was, it was um, 
tremendous amount of work and agony because remember we had to, in this case we now had MOUs, there were attorneys involved at the Chancellor's office, I was deposed by the um, you know, the faculty union of the, the California Faculty Association, many, many, many uh, issues that were covered here. So as you venture into this territory, I can give you lots of advice on how to do that. But what we, what we did here in the spring is um, we had a, an explicit interest in, to ask, does the MOOC environment um, assist students at disadvantage, disadvantaged students, economically disadvantaged, uh, from underserved neighborhoods and so on. So we set up, in some cases, the worst possible scenario for um, testing. You know, we were, we were looking specifically for students who um, had remediation needs and so forth. So for example, in our remedial math course, what we did is we enrolled, I, I said there would be no more than 100 students in each of these three courses in the spring. Half of them would be San Jose State students, half of them could come from the outside. And we set the price arbitrarily at $150 to, um, you know, if it scales up, that $150 per student could earn you significant revenue. But we didn't want to undercut our community college sisters in California, so we set it at $100. Um, $50, about $138 to do it, take a three credit course at the community college in California. So um, the remedial math students, for example, were all students who had failed remedial math the previous semester. Okay. Then, uh, and in addition, th th those are our San Jose State students. The, the non-San Jose State students, um, the governor had, uh, when he was um, mayor of Oakland, had started a sc two schools, char two charter schools. One was Oakland Military Institute in a very, um, you know, uh, economically disadvantaged neighborhood of Oakland. And so those, he made his, the principal and the administrators at o OMI made available their students who would sign up for remedial math. So we were looking at high school students from disadvantaged backgrounds to see how this would work. Um, and then similarly, some of them entered into college algebra. We were also looking for veterans as well to see how this might work uh, for those at most need. So in some ways, in retrospect, you might have said we should have stacked the cards and put in students who were like more traditional, um, uh, you know, uh, Admiss eligible, admissible students and so on. But we were really interested at that time to see how this would work for disadvantaged students. And then in the summer, we added two new courses, Introduction to Psychology and Introduction to Computer Programming. Um, another two teams of faculty joined in there. And uh, we increased the enrollments um, beyond the 100. So what happened? Um, it, what, here, here it is, this was the pilot. Um, here's the information just explained to you for the, the spring. And uh, here it's the underserved focus. Again, the other interesting part is many of the MOOC uh, providers don't necessarily um, try to increase human contact. Uh, our, in our work with Sebastian, he was very much in favor of trying to help increase human contact. So they hired course mentors. And the course mentors then worked uh, with the faculty and the students to check in. They were almost like your online mother. So uh, if you didn't log on, your course mentor would, f they actually texted, phoned, and emailed students and said, didn't see you log on this week. Where are you? Quiz is coming up, and so on and so forth. So um, that was um, another different feature that differentiated us from other MOOCs. Uh, again, the course fee was very low. Um, I will tell you what's really interesting is in the summer when we opened up um, the, all five courses to larger numbers of students, uh, some, uh, quite a number, several hundred um, students enrolled from all over the world. Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, and in, from the United States, and what was interesting is that um, the number of students who, did ne who never even opened the course was was significant and we wondered what was going on there. When we did the calling and so forth, we found out what really happened. The students were not enrolling, but their parents were enrolling them in these courses over the summer. <laughs> but at $150, they didn't think it was that big of a deal. Okay. So, um, abundant media frenzy. Here's a picture of the New York Times, um, made the cover of the business page, and then the New York Times later ran us on the front cover uh, later on in April. And this is Sebastian in one of our, our bricks and mortar classrooms at San Jose. So we were, you know, um, very much featured in the limelight there for the, the several months, you know, about a six month span of time. 
Um, in fact, so much so that if you can see here, this was a Chronicle of Higher Ed called it the major players in the MOOC universe map. And down here you see Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Anat, uh, Raphael, Penn, Caltech, Austin, UT, Austin, Berkeley, and guess what? San Jose State on the map. <laughs> April 29th, that's our claim to fame here, right? By, uh, according to the um, uh, Chronicle. All right. Now, that was, uh, that was a positive thing. Here's a negative one. Now, uh, as I said, what happened here was very interesting. Um, this is a chronicle story. It was an open letter written by the philosophy department at San Jose State, an open letter not to the university, but guess what? It was an open letter to the Harvard professor who was involved in edX, and that was uh, Michael Sandel. Michael Sandel is a uh, you know internationally famous uh, faculty member at Harvard. Here he is teaching his course on justice. Okay, and uh, they wrote a pretty long, um, interesting letter that the the Chronicle published in its entirety. Why professors at San Jose State won't use the Harvard professor's MOOC. And what was very interesting here is that um, the, I think the rationale that they were trying to make is that there's, you have to remember too that the CSU is a unionized environment. And um, so what they were fearful of is several things. I think the most significant of which is to say that if there are MOOC providers at the elite institutions and that those that, that content is adopted wholesale by other higher institutions across the country, then you may effectively be inadvertently creating a two-tiered system of a higher education whereby only the elite professors will be in charge of content and that if you have um, the you know, second-tier institutions being serving, in their words, as sort of glorified teaching assistants. All right. And um, while on the surface that does seem to be a worry, what I think the, the, the problem it didn't, the, the reason it didn't necessarily hold true, ring true for our campus, is as provost, remember at, with the edX material, um, I was saying that as provost, you have as a faculty member exercised your academic freedom rights, you can use as much or as little of the content as provided by the MOOC provider. And therefore, you can think of it almost like a high-tech, uh, interactive textbook. Just as a professor chooses a textbook, um, and you don't, professors don't write their, the textbook for their own courses, they can choose them from elite institutions, um, authors elsewhere. So that didn't necessarily hold. But what I will say that is uh, something to be concerned about and then, of course, they're concerned about unionization. If you have um, you know, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of students in a course, then that reduces the pool uh, of work for both uh, tenure track as well as um, uh, lectures on campuses. So that was their other uh, concern. And, but I will say that it is of interest to consider the fact that um, Intellectual heterogeneity is an important component of American higher ed. And we are, as um, you know, doctoral students trained in different institutions, and just as uh, if you got an undergraduate degree at an, a certain institution, they tend not to want to allow you to take your doctorate because you'll have continued similar um, you know, viewpoints of that discipline. So they encourage you to go elsewhere. So there is some truth to be said about uh, heterogeneity of intellectual content. Um, so so nonetheless, uh, this caused a big furor on campus, and uh, now the, the philosophy professors are quite famous um, and get uh, interviewed um, in many different venues. Ellie, yes. So is it, it is the case that this was a discussion about about a move that was not connected to the Udacity project? Yes, this was about edX, but they were concerned about MOOCs in general. Okay. So uh, MOOCs in general, and especially the MOOCifying of general education, that was something that but, concerned them. But this, this, was kind of a, this was a simultaneous conversation to what you were doing. With Correct. That. This was all happening okay. the same time, May of that, that, that 2013, last year. Yes. Um, OK, so uh, that then caused the, the press to be very hot on our tails to figure out, all right, what's happening with the, the Udacity pilot? Because remember, it was running in the spring. And um, uh, again, you know, if you're going to do research, you do need to do it in a careful, deliberative, empirically you know, verifiable way. And research takes time. So it turns out that um, the, 
the press, I'm not sure which press, um, maybe it was Inside Higher Ed, I, don't, I can't recall which uh, venue, uh, got access to the, the, you know, the um, pass rates of students that were in the original spring pilot, remember the three math courses. And what we were doing is that our NSF funded grant uh, was tabulating the number of students who were passing the course relative to uh, the number of students who passed it on, in our bricks and mortar courses. And as you can see here, the pass rates are substantially lower than on our on-campus performances. And this is uh, performance over the past six semesters, um, so three years prior. And um, we were in the midst of trying to publish this to explain that the original rationale was that we started with the worst case scenario. We wanted to see how this could or maybe not help students who are most, at, most disadvantaged and so forth. But because without the context of the larger report and the explanation, um, the press simply jumped on it and announced um, MOOCs are dead because uh, <laughs> the pass rates are, are low. So, and of course, you know, without the scientific verification. So we then um, was subsequently were able to publish the full report. You can find the full report at this URL um, the, the, from the NSF study. And this is our uh, Associate Dean of Science who uh, secured the grant for us with NSF, Elaine Collins. Um, so then that's why, uh, again, the, the media started harping on us and saying, what's happening now? Because uh, at this point in time, the, the courses for the summer were now running but with the expanded edition of the two other um, uh, courses, psychology and computer science. And at that point in time, um, we decided to, at the campus, decided to hold off for one semester. Our faculty were uh, pretty tired. They wanted to revise and renew their courses. We wanted to take what they had learned from the first iteration and, and figure out how to uh, improve it. We also had many sort of mind-boggling, tiny administrivia things to, to work off. How do students register? How do they pay? How can we make it more seamless? How can we include grading in a grade book? Because these, um, Udacity, for example, and um, edX didn't have a full LMS functioning. OK, so these were the outcomes from the spring, uh, summer. So as you can see here in blue, three courses actually produced greater um, performance than the in-class, in, on semester, um, the, the, the bricks and mortar classes. And that was stats, college algebra, and intro programming. And so the, the results were much, much better. And did the press report this? Not so much. OK, so this then leads to the what, what does the public think about, or not the public, what do the academic leaders think about MOOCs in light of all this media frenzy? Um, so what we see here is this is Sloan C data um, from 2012 report that uh, many CAOs are saying that maybe MOOCs are not something that they are convinced about yet, but they still agree that online learning is critical to the long-term future. Uh, so what I wanted to end with was a little bit about the importance of student learning and to help you think about some of the parameters if you're going to move forward, not just with MOOCs, but with online learning in general. To me, as a cognitive you know, psychologist and a social scientist, uh, what we're all about here in this effort is to really improve student learning and to understand the parameters and the factors that are related to that. Okay? And if, if you think about uh, what we expect of undergraduates, uh, what their skills are. In the old days, you know, writing, uh, typing, maybe now even word processing, and when you think about sort of technology skills, is what well, you should ask yourself, do your students as undergraduates, what skills should they possess when they are graduate from your institutions? Um, certainly word perfect, I mean, no, no longer word perfect, but <laughs> I remember those days. Uh, what, what do you want them to walk out with when they have your emblematic diploma? So, this is an interesting question because what we're now seeing is that there are now um, states which are requiring online courses in high school, right? And so Alabama, Florida, Michigan, Virginia, there are now discussions in Georgia, Idaho. Every few months you'll find some new additions to this. And there are now institutions of higher learning uh, uh, that also require at least one online course before they graduate. And this is because as the world moves into the digital format, it is increasingly likely that we will be um, improving lifelong learning, professional development in online venues. So why should the universities lag so far behind every other industry in the application 
application and use of technology. So what does this mean for your institution? Um, I would say to you, first of all, as CAOs, presidents, or others in the highest levels, you must carefully consider what is your mission. Align, if you're going to go into online, whether it be degree programs, courses, whatnot, make sure it aligns with your institutional mission and consider how that impacts all of the sectors, your undergraduates, your graduate students, your alumni, understand that the online teaching modality is a continuum. It is not just one or the other. There's um, there's face-to-face, -face, there's blended or flipped, there's online as well. Focus again on student learning. Um, critical, the most important, one of the most important features here is it's important to consider the stakeholders. If you rush into this too quickly, a lot of misunderstandings can happen, which is in the case of the philosophy department. Um, faculty support is absolutely key. And then this, obviously, if you're at this level, you understand that business plan and infrastructure are critical ingredients in making your decision. Um, this includes many different items. I won't go through all of these, but just know that these are all things you must wrestle with if you are moving into this arena. Everything from IP, FERPA, accessibility, sustainability, uh, LMS integration, um, people soft, you know, set, you know uh, central management, um, systems as well. And then many things about faculty. Um, it's really critical that you get the goodwill and the interest um, and motivation from your faculty in, in trying this kind of innovation. Uh, I, uh, as provost, provided robust training as well as incentives. In the case of Udacity, um, I looked at other institutions, Indiana University, their president provided $15,000 per faculty to do online courses. In the Udacity case, I provided 15,000 per course. So if there was a team, they shared that. Um, and that, it because it, it is considerable at, uh, amount of time. I think our faculty averaged about 400 hours uh, to create one new course for Udacity. Uh, consultation is very important. Um, identifying, uh, figuring out which courses, et cetera. Um, absolutely key, when you start this, you must build in a priori assessments. I'd encourage you to seek external fun uh, funding. Uh, make sure that you pay attention to le learning analytics if you can incorporate that into your effort. Um, collect both quantitative and qualitative data, very important there. And collect student data, not just from student performance, but from the faculty engaged in these efforts. Uh, finally, you know, lots of things that you have to work very carefully with your marketing, communications, and media. Um, so some of you have seen the Gartner's uh, Emerging Technologies Hype Cycle. Be mindful of the larger co context of, that these kinds of movements take place in terms of the um, public um, perception. And again, go focusing back on what is learning. And, and uh, I liked Diana Oblinger, she's the president for EDUCAUSE. Her definition of learning is much more than accessing content. In our 21st century, it's a complex blend of skills, competencies that continue learning throughout life, include the ability to think critically, solve complex programs, problems, work collaboratively, communicate, and pursue self-directed learning or metacognition. And these are very important constructs. As you build online courses, make sure they're not just at the low, lowest level of Bloom's taxonomy, that, but that you fill in ways to um, make sure that students are getting a much deeper experience. OK, so um, the moral of the story is, as, and again, I'm speaking to you as a cognitive psychologist, is human learning is a very complex social enterprise. Um, we would tell you in the literature, Piaget, for example, would say that infants are born with an automatic, innate desire to acquire knowledge and information. But beyond that, we will also, in the institutions of higher ed, we're trying to create knowledge and disseminate that knowledge, apply that knowledge in a way to improve the human good, the public good. And within all of these factors, it is replete with meaning, because as human beings, we are constantly seeking meaning in what we do. So the good news is um, that, and this is sort of the irony, is the Ivy League, which is considerably considered most um, prominent for its Nobel laureates, its research and scientific advances, have now opened the door, and I thank them. I thank Anat and Stanford and MIT and Harvard uh, for opening the door and bringing into discourse sharply focused the importance of teaching and learning. As soon as they entered the MOOC world, the focus was on teaching 
and learning. And so that opened new avenues for us to consider at institutions of our own how this can make a difference for our students, both in their professional development, for lifelong learning, for society at large. And this promotes healthy innovation and alternatives for us in higher ed. So online learning today is not your father's Oldsmobile. Students may be digital natives, but they are still naive. They don't quite know how to use the technology. We need to help them understand how to use that. Um, we have now available, by not your old Oldsmobile, is the idea that the new online inter, uh, next uh, tools that we have available are quite powerful. And um, you know, Candace can talk to you about some of this. But what a lot of people think is that online t uh, courses are um, that's not high touch, that you don't feel like there's connection. And I'm here to tell you that no, there are many tools that are now available that can make the interaction between professor and student much more um, intimate and high touch than in the past. Uh, with video, synchronous, asynchronous kinds of tools, we have adaptive learning now, data analytics and so forth. Um, there's now ample research to show that effective teaching is um, enhanced by the use of technology, and there are many places where you can now go. Sloan C, uh, Quality Matters, the, the learning rubrics that are at A, um, C, and U that can help you design high quality, effective, interactive courses. So what I'm telling you here is I want to leave you with the message that um, putting the power and innovation of the research, not just on technology and learning, but there are significant um, years of research on teaching and learning in general. As PhDs, most of us never have had explicit t um, t training in how to teach, and let alone how to teach using technology. So what we need to do is understand the critical foundational importance of investing in faculty development, instructional design, assessment, and research. So final words of advice, be brave. <laughs> Create, learn, assess, and good luck. Uh, Thank you. I don't know if you want to take the one most burning question <laughs> or catch Alan afterwards and have a little coffee break. Anyone feel they have the most important question in the room? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but just be brief. I think I'm Chris Newfield from at UC Santa Barbara. I have a question, at two yes. related ones. Can you say more about why the summer trial worked better than the spring? And then secondly, can you say something about costs for San Jose, especially with the more successful trial? Yes, okay. Um, the reason for why it's more successful is part, probably attributable to the fact that once we opened it up, um, the n number of students who came in to take the classes were more highly educated. In fact, we had, I don't, I don't know the exact percentage because um, it was self-report data. You know, what is your level of education? But something like 20%, maybe even 30% of the students already had a bachelor's degree and or a graduate degree at the master's and or doctorate. So there were some people who were already um, had degrees that were coming back just to take a course, and maybe they never took a, a you know Java programming course before, and they wanted to take it. So um, it was not re we were not getting current high school students or college students as they were currently matriculated. So that's probably why the the results went up. As for cost, um, you know the this at running at $150 per student, you are losing money big time, um, but. For San Jose, it really didn't, it's, it was, you know, for the three courses in the spring, it was only 45,000, because 15 times three. But then if you figure in all the, the labor and the time put in by all the other different divisions, it was significant. The, really, the, the greatest cost was borne by Udacity, because he had teams, about seven or eight people at Udacity working with the faculty creating those courses, and their, all their salaries, their time, the technology, the videoing, the editing, all of that. So really, Sebastian's team um, shouldered the significant majority of the cost. But obviously, if it scaled up, you could have certainly made a, a good deal of revenue. Well, well, thank you again for letting us all benefit from your experience. <laughs> thank you.